Well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Jo McDonough and I'm the current director of the Nicholson Centre for British Studies and it's my great honour to introduce this event um, this evening given under the auspices of the Sarah H. Schaffner Distinguished Visiting Professorship Fund. This is an endowment within the university to fund just that, a distinguished professor in humanities and social sciences to visit the university for an extended visit. Past incumbents of this chair have included the philosopher Bernard Williams, the literary critic Marilyn Butler, and the classicist Simon Goldhill, and most recently the post-colonial critic Rajaswari Sundarajan. Uh, members of our own university community might be surprised to be reminded of his existence because the Schaffner <laughs> professorship went um, got lost in the machine for a while and we're especially grateful to Dean Anne Robertson for um, in the Humanities Division um, for leading the search and discovery operation which makes today's um, event possible. So after the lecture, there's going to be a Q&A. Actually, I didn't check with you. Is that okay? We'll ask you some <laughs> questions. And um, following that, there's a reception in the room behind us, and I hope everyone will be able to join us for that. But my role in this event is only to introduce the introducer, which I will do now without ado. And our introducer is Professor James Chandler, William K. Ogden, Distinguished Service Professor in the Departments of English and Cinema and Media Studies, and Long long-term affiliates of the Nicholson Centre. So thanks, Jim. I have, uh, I have merch. <laughs> uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Roger Parker um, today as, among other things, I think, the first musicologist to hold the Schaffner Professorship. And I know I speak for many of you here in this room when I say that it's just been wonderful to have him uh, on campus since his arrival last month. All thanks to uh, Joe and Martha for working things out at Nicholson and the music department and, and to Anne. Uh, I wanted also to acknowledge Roger's wife, Linda Cranham, who joined him here this week, uh, but unfortunately she's home with a bad cold and didn't want to infect us all. Um, but I do want to recommend highly uh, Lyndon's new recording of the Bach cello suites, which I've been enjoying these last few days. Um, they're, they're really terrific. So Roger began his teaching career at Cornell in 1982 in the same music department with former president Don, Ra Don Randall, who I can now see in the audience, uh, and Carol, welcome to you both. Um, and from there, he uh, moved on to Oxford, um, and then to Cambridge, where he would serve as Dean of the Arts and Sciences faculty for a few years. And then finally, uh, back to King's College London, uh, to the department from which he had originally taken his PhD uh, some years earlier. In the course of these more than four decades, he has established himself not only as an absolutely central figure in opera studies worldwide, but also as a powerful voice in the larger field of musicology itself. It would take much of the next hour to give even a bare-bones sketch of his publications, which include uh, well over a dozen books authored, co-authored, or edited, scores of influential articles and reviews, and a long string of major editions of the operatic work of, among other composers, Rossini, Donizetti, Verdi, and Puccini. If you are in music studies, you probably know a great deal of this work already, if you are not, and here's my second piece of merch, I highly recommend uh, this book as a starting point, a beautifully produced and even more beautifully written history of opera for the non-specialist undertaken by Roger and his frequent collaborator, collaborator Carolyn Abate, A History of the Opera. Beyond musicology, and I suppose more relevant to his subject today, the work Roger has done to situate the music he studies in wider contexts has also earned him the respect of scholars across disciplines working in the 19th century more broadly. I had the great good fortune to work with Roger on an inter interdisciplinary project when he invited Alison Winter and me to serve as non-musicological advisors uh, uh, to an impressive group of younger scholars he assembled for music and science in 19th century London. 
This was eventually published under the editorship of two of Roger's former students in 2017 as the volume Sound Knowledge. This project, it turned out, was just one of many carried out under the auspices of the generative 2 million euro grant he had won from the EU for a wide-ranging project on music in London, 1800 to 1850. A major scholarly enterprise premised on the recognition that, despite our assumptions about the centrality of, say, Milan, Vienna, and Paris to 19th century European music culture, London was where much of the real action was happening. Another book that emerged from this project, again under Roger's impressive supervision, was The Melodramatic Moment, which was published here uh, with the press, I think in 2020, again by two of his, two others of his former, edited by two others of his former graduate students. After that music and science meeting, uh, he and I and Allison, just before we lost her, cooked up a scheme to widen the horizon of his London, London project even further um, with the founding of the Musical Pass Consortium. The consortium ran for four years and included scholars across fields, not only from King's College and Chicago, with Martha Feldman in a major leadership role, but also from Yale and Berkeley. I, I want to take this occasion to say publicly how very much I've enjoyed working with Roger over the course of the last decade. Not least, I've come to know the remarkably large and accomplished group of his former PhD students, many of them major leaders in the field. And I've also come to appreciate some of Roger's singular virtues, his calm temperament, especially his steadiness in crisis, his richly sophisticated ear, and his highly developed curiosity. So allow me to close with just a brief urban anecdote that illustrates all of these anecdotes. Uh, it's not set on the streets of 19th century London, but actually on the streets of present-day Chicago. Soon after his arrival last month, I was driving Roger to dinner in the near north. We were on the far left lane of Grand Avenue, which at that point, near Clark, it's a four-lane boulevard, and I spotted a parking place ahead, but just on the other side of this very wide street. So I decided to make my way across, across Grand, slowing traffic behind us, and drivers began to honk their horns in irritation, increasing numbers of them as we made our way lane by lane across this very wide boulevard. It was pretty chaotic. Roger, through all this, was absolutely unflappable, perfectly serene. And then, once we had made our way across and parked, he began to describe in some detail the strange harmonics of the sound made by all those blaring horns. Each, he said, has been made constructed to sound at a different pitch so that it might be possible to distinguish different sources of honking on a given time at the street. What an ear, I thought, to be able to make out an urban audioscape with such discrimination. But then, always curious, Roger went on to pose characteristically unlooked-for questions. I wonder, he said, how the different pitches of these various car horns are actually established when they're manufactured. I wonder whether the manufacturers confer about all this. And if they do, I wonder if they coordinate the decision-making for the different sounds they produce. How would they even go about that? I don't suppose we'll have an answer to any of these questions today, though they've been bothering me since this happened. But I know he will be posing and addressing other questions of interest and moment about Victorian London. So please welcome Roger Parker to tell us about painting and sounding the 19th century metropolis. Get my merch. <laughs> That's my way of dealing with being scared out of my wits. <laughs> um, thanks very much, Jim. It's, a, it's an enormous pleasure to be here, and I've been really touched by the kindness of, of so many people. Um, it's also given um, <clears throat> a really important new lease of life to this project, which I'm doing about music in London in the in the 1830s. It will be a project that, when it sees its completion, will be dedicated in part to to the community here, which is which has revitalised it. Um, there's a <clears throat> famous quotation here. 
that is a kind of epigraph to my paper, <laughs> the sea reach of the Thames stretched before us like the beginning of an interminable waterway. In the offing, the sea and the sky were welded together without a joint, and in the luminous space, the tan sails of the barges drifting up with the tide seemed to stand still in red clusters of canvas sharply peaked with gleams of varnished sprits. In other words, Conrad, seeing uh, this picture of nature as one that has been, or metaphorically um, talking about it in terms of the fact that it might be a constructed painting. The air was dark above Gravesend, and farther back still seemed condensed into a mournful gloom, <coughs> brooding motionless over the biggest and greatest town on earth. <clears throat> so that's my epigraph. Um, I wanted to begin, I want to begin with two notions of panorama. One is elite and imaginary, a staple of romantic poetry. Think Caspar David Friedrich. From a mountain top, as far as the wanderer's eye can see, the world is laid out in every direction. The view is sovereign and panoptic. We will all have saddled and ready our favourite examples of this, and mine will come in a moment. The other notion, though, is more of a niche interest. Now, it is neither poetic nor imaginary. It's real and concrete, and partly because of its often massy contours, and partly because it was evidently at odds with late 18th century high art ideals of mimesis, it constantly struggled for elite status. I refer to the early 19th century craze in London, and in several <clears throat> other large urban centres for a notable new visual technology, a seemingly unending stream of 360-degree paintings. Some were small, domestic even, others were of enormous size and exhibited in large, purpose-built buildings. The title these paintings soon gained was Panorama, and the craze for them was such that very soon after they acquired a local habitation, their names started to enter the lexicon in a broader, more figurative sense, to proliferate into the bewildering array of metaphorical uses it now commands. The real panoramas were made of canvas, wood and steel. They could and did fail structurally, grow dingy with age, fall into unpicturesque ruin. The imaginary panoramas of poetry, of course, never decay. My paper will focus for the most part on the real object, as built in the early 19th century, and my aim, broadly speaking, is to inquire into its soundscape. The panorama has, of course, been profitably analysed from a visual social point of view, with major studies such as those by Stefan Ottoman and Bernard Comont, doubtless known to many here, not to mention Walter Benjamin, whose theories go in front of them. Its interaction with the sounding world has, though, mostly been left to one side. But I want to start with the imaginary, the poetic visions, in particular the musical sounds they stimulated. This will serve as a useful prelude, demonstrating how, at more or less the same time, elite and non-elite culture could diverge in conceiving the role of sound vis-à-vis -vis space and vision. So, there are many richly canonic musical representations of vast and impressive panoramas. Mysterious landscapes, pastoral fields, and the like are common in what used unproblematically to be called classical music. Perhaps the famous fifth door that opens in the castle of Bartok's Bluebeard, with those grandiloquent full orchestral parallel triads, and an ecstatic scream from Bluebeard's poor, confused bride as she sees beyond the confines of his gloomy abode. Or perhaps, stretching the classical a little, but not much, to the inspirations of Max Steiner and others in Hollywood westerns of the post-war era. I've gone back further, though, and chosen a poetic musical panorama par excellence from the high classical repertory. It started life as Goethe's famous poem Anne Schwager Kronos to Coachman <coughs> Kronos, written apparently on a coach ride between Darmstadt and Frankfurt in 1774. 
In this wild storm and drang effusion, the furious paced coach journey is an obvious allegory for life's rock rock strewn passage. There's a reason the coachman is called Kronos. In the third verse, the protagonist, after a hair raising, nausea inducing ascent to the top of a steep hill, sees before him a vast panorama, weit, hoch, herrlich, wide, tall, splendid. And there's the verse, move yourself, Kronos, settle a rattling pace, downhill runs the path, horrid giddiness seizes me, my mind, it seizes my mind at your caution, quick, jolting over the sticks and stones, speed onward into life. What now, yet again, that breath-sapping drag, step by step up the hill, keep going, then don't let up, strive onward in hope. And here's the panoramic moment, Wide, tall, splendid, the vision on every side of life, from mountain to mountain, the eternal spirit is in the air with promise of eternal life. Okay, now Franz Schubert's famous setting of Goethe's poem was composed in 1816, thus while he was still a teenager, and thus near the time he wrote the famous, more famous song, El König, a song which in many ways is similar to this one. Here the panoramic moment, the weit hoch herrlich, is marked with a sonorous and registral explosion, underpinned by, or if you will, articulating an overwhelming harmonic contrivance. In preparation, there's inevitable rising sequence as the hill is climbed, then a pause on E-flat major, which seems like a plateau of sorts, and then on weit hoch herrlich, As the overwhelming vista appears, a very strange harmonic moment, an unprepared leap to B major, fortissimo, with repetitive strain-inducing triplets in the right hand. Okay, now I'm going to attempt a great masterpiece now and transfer you to listening to the song. This is sung by the person Roland Bat always described disparagingly as F.D. <laughs> uh, here it is. Rising up the hill and now pausing E flat the panorama. And so on. (laughs) Two interconnected points, one small, one large, will serve as a transition to my main subject. The first, the small, and I hope non-contentious one, is that Schubert, and for that matter Bartok, a century later, elected to represent the panoramic moment in part with an attention-grabbing harmonic progression and in part with a sudden exploration of extreme instrumental register. To put this another way, Schubert greeted the panorama with a display of the most advanced musical technology of an instrumental register and a sequence of chords that would, at least in this configuration, have been unthinkable only decades earlier. Now I need, I, I know this is not right in, uh, in spoken papers, but I need to insert a footnote here, um, a small cautionary footnote. We always take a risk, and should uh, indeed be aware of it, we always take a risk when we call something conjured up by musical sounds a technology. What is meant by that 
is the new tonal progression I've been talking about, a prosthesis, something designed to do better what some earlier unenhanced or unmediated gesture did less boldly or loudly? Or is the progression the realized acoustic symbol of an actual technology that arose at this historical juncture? As Adorno argued for Wagner, deracinated harmony was the acoustic equivalent of the misleading illusion of magic lanterns, etc. Well, in this case, more than uh, the, the, the more the first explanation, the prosthetic, uh, than, the, than the second, I guess, but the ambiguity remains and is important. End of footnote. The second point, the large one, is more complicated. In one obvious sense, Goethe's and Schubert's evocation of the panorama is consonant with broad trends in elite music, indeed in elite art generally, during the late 18th and early 19th centuries. It follows an expected path by virtue of the fact that the panorama in question displays the natural world, indeed nature, at its most sublime. One might conventionally bracket this preference for nature as a topic, as a, for nature as a topic in terms more or less vague of, of romanticism. But it's important to recall that nature, scare quotes now for that word, is at that period increasingly becoming a topic associated with elite culture. Thus, and particular for my purposes here today, the issue of how poetry and art music conceive the panorama is perhaps better contextualised within an increasing tension between the elite and the popular. As Anne Birmingham explored in relation to the visual arts, the rapid urbanisation of the late 18th and 19th centuries, with its vastly expanding audience for art of all kinds, tended to put the most elevated of cultural forms on the defensive, what uh, Birmingham has called, quote, an embattled posture vis-a-vis -vis the vulgar public, unquote. This became their and by inheritance our naturalised image of the romantic artists. The attitudes, and famously, can be found in some stalwarts of Ing Lit. A canonic one comes in the preface to the lyrical ballads, in which Wordsworth stated a multitude of causes unknown to former times. I can see Jim mouthing the words as I say them. <laughs> a, <laughs> multitude of, <laughs> a multitude of causes unknown to former times are now acting with a combined force to blunt the discriminating powers of the mind and unfitting it for all voluntary exertion to reduce it to a state of almost savage torpor. The most effective of these causes are the great national events which are daily taking place and the increasing accumulation of men in cities, where the uniformity of the occupations produces a craving for extraordinary incident, which the rapid communication of intelligence hourly gratifies. All this was with rope justified the concentration in the lyrical ballads on, quote, humble and rustic life, because in that condition the essential passions of the heart find a better soil in which they can attain their maturity, are less under restraint, and speak a plainer, more emphatic language, unquote. Now, it's interesting to ask oneself, could the same be said of elite musical production in the 19th century? In terms of instrumental music, that period sees pastoral symphonies by the muddy cartload and a respectable number of craggy nature-painting tone poems. But how many elite musical celebrations of the modern city do we know from this period? The city, it would seem, is precisely the cultural province of the lower classes, a place without aesthetic value, whose sounds are thus impossible to ennoble. This nervousness about contemporary urban spaces is most striking, for example, in 19th century operas. When present at all, early 19th century operas, when present at all, cities tend to be situated at a comfortable historical remove from modernity. With a few significant exceptions, Verdi is la Traviata is the obvious one. It's not until the fin de siècle in works such as Puccini's La Boheme or Charpentier's Louise that the contemporary city becomes a field of musical dreams. 
Indeed, and tellingly, such operas are commonly assumed to boast their modernity precisely through their exploration of this novel soundscape. However, as James Chandler and Kevin Gilmartin have argued, this rather neat formulation of elite art retreating to a pastoral or rocky and sublime ideal in the face of an expanding and increasingly socially mixed audience, this in itself marks a more interesting and less often discussed circumstance, that the nature depictors of elite culture frequently gesture towards the urban through indirect means, often within the expressive fabric of their utterances. One example that Chandler and Gil Martin recall is Coleridge's 1818 Fragments of an Essay on Beauty, in which the poet offers a fascinating gloss on Wordsworth's most famous nature poem. Quote, the most universal associations of motion begin with the functions of the passions of life, as when, on passing out of a crowded city into the fields on a day in June, we describe the grass and kingcups as nodding their heads and dancing in the breeze. In other words, the natural landscape is represented by means of ghostly metaphorical echoes of the teeming urban environment from which putatively this was an escape. But what would it mean to search within the musical productions of the elite for the gesture towards the urban within which the aristocratic pastoral space might be reimagined? The application of such insights to musical domains, ever resistant as they are to unequivocal meaning, is by no means certain. The underlying mechanism here is one in which a concealed modernity the dynamic of the otherwise despised urban is put to service in maintaining a representation of exalted and distinctly not modern spaces or times. Thus one might, following the lead of Anselm Gerhardt and several more recent authors, think again about Paris and Grand Opera, the way in which that genre dressed its determinedly ancient plots in the latest scenographic and musical technologies using new lighting techniques or novel instrumental or harmonic contraptions to underpin and articulate stories of age-old dynastic squabbles. Looked at this way, there's an obvious sense in which elite entertainment reveals itself to be of the city. Perhaps such approaches and insights might cautiously be extended to other genres. For example, and to return to Schubert for one last glance, the same might be argued for Anschwager Kronos, if with an inevitable stretching of interpretive license. Goethe's panorama may indeed consist of range upon range of mountains, of timeless nature at its most sublime, but as I mentioned moments ago, the harmonic science and instrumental means by which Schubert, employed, which Schubert employed to represent those mountains is unequivocally modern and, in this sense, firmly of the city. Okay, we can now turn to panorama from the, as it were, the opposite end of the spectrum, focusing not on elite representation, but rather on the phenomenon as it existed in massy material form and in a specific location and time. And to do so, we will depart from anything musical or even acoustic, and that absence is itself a telling one. I'll say straight out, rather than attempt to make a shared project of these differing conceptions of panorama, the elite and the less elite, and, and there have been several attempts to do so recently, arranging them neatly under some large theory of scopic modernity. What I want to do is keep them separate, at least for a time, not to try and collapse them into the same big theory ideas. Now, as I said earlier, the idea of panorama took on that nomenclature and new, newly embodied meanings around 1800, meanings that had a complex relationship with urban modernity, as well as being one of the great commercial success stories of 19th century urban culture. And their first important centre was London, undoubtedly the century's largest and most lucrative cultural market. The invention of the artistic technique whereby spectators could be placed 
within a 360 degree view of a given scene is usually attributed to the Irishman Robert Barker in the last years of the 18th century. Originally called La Nature à coup d'oeil, Nature at a Glance, it acquired in 1891 its Greek inflated name, Panorama. This at a time when marketing via Frenchness had quite suddenly become seriously ill-advised <laughs> to anxious neighbours across the channel. Always have to get a dig at the French in there. You know. In many ways, though, Barker's principal innovation was not in perspecti perspectival technique. More important was the industrial-scale exploitation of a newly expanding audience for such representations. Barker devised a system whereby his panoram panoramic paintings could be displayed in large, purpose-built edifices, one that placed viewers in a novel and scripted relationship to the artistic object ranged around them. In a sense, they were liberated, these viewers, with no fixed viewpoint to detain them. But in another, they were fixed as never before, necessarily prevented from approaching the object of display beyond a certain distance in order to preserve that object's perspectival marvels. As discussed earlier, in these early days, some of the most prominent panoramas cemented their non-elite status by featuring vistas not of country <coughs> meadows or mountainous horizons, but rather of the very urban sites in which they were located. When represented in this new contemporary visual medium, the newly liberated, newly restricted viewers found the 19th century city differently legible. The painted cityscape could become the object both of education and of aesthetic contemplation. Its multitude of details and relationship to the surrounding countryside emerging in fresh configurations. The panoramic craze of the early 19th century quickly spread around Europe, and it did so, and as it did so, a constant public desire for novelty saw rapid changes in subject matter. Enduringly popular and obviously suited to chauvinistic display and propaganda were panoramas of battles fought and won, other demonstrations of military might, the assembled warships of the British Navy, for example, were also much in evidence. Yet cityscapes remained a constant feature of panoramic display, sometimes giving rise to a kind of panorama tourism by which new cities could be consumed at minimal effort and expense without travelling much of anywhere. As one critic put it, quote, by a change as rapid as in any of Shakespeare's plays, a cockney traveller steps at once out of Leicester Fields into Constantinople. Steam carriages and balloons, though pretty miracles in their way, are nothing to the magic of this transition. Unquote. But among these cityscapes, the grandest project of all, at least in London, saw a return to the panorama's earliest subject matter. In the late 1820s, there opened a vast, bespoke building in Regent's Park, called, with obvious monumental intentions, the Colosseum, within which was, hound, was housed a grand panorama of the City of London. As the Morning Chronicle put it, with a telling mixture of artistic and scientific accolade. <coughs> Nothing can be more agreeable and more exalted to the mind than this magnificent spectacle. And it is remarkable not more for its mag magnitude and sublimity than for the minutely accurate picture of each particular house. Histories, descriptions, maps, prints are all imperfect and defective when compared to this immense panorama. They are scraps and mere touches of the pen and pencil, whilst this imparts at a glance, at one view, a cyclopedia of information, a concentrated history, a local topography of the largest and most influential city in the world." Unquote. <coughs> Alas, and in spite of many such celebrations in its first year, what one paper called this Leviathan of Art continually founded on the rock-strewn, inhospitable seas of 19th century capitalism. Its creators fled the country even before the building opened, and subsequent brief periods of success, albeit considerable, never managed to recoup the vast expenses demanded by its construction, upkeep and constant renovation.
In Richard Altick's resonant words, the Colosseum was ever the victim of, quote, over-sanguine entrepreneurial hope and the show-going public's fickleness, unquote. <laughs> Realised from sketches made by the intrepid artist Thomas Horner, who drew them perched on a temporary platform erected on the top of St Paul's Cathedral. Just think of it. The sheer scale of the Colosseum's London panorama is demonstrated by this illustration, which shows the building at its first opening, still under construction in 1829. The canvas was 24,000 feet square, approximately half an acre and as you can see had to be painted by workers suspended by means of especially constructed scaffolding and cradles. The sheer industrial scale of the enterprise, the early emergence of leisure industry capital, was invariably highlighted in contemporary reports. What the illustration demonstrates, for example, is the necessary division of labour. Marx would have called it Arbeitsteilung. Even within the artistic aspect of the project, teams of painters were necessarily employed to complete the work. Some were involved in fine detail, painting the lower parts, which showed the city's building and streets in all their intricacy. Others, though, had the mundane task of filling in the endless expanses of sky, which occupied the upper portion of the dome. And even when it came to fine detail, the directors of the project, both Horner and his principal backer, had by this stage decamped to the United States to escape their debts. Even the new directors of the project found that ordinary house painters were more reliable at filling out the vast tapestry than were those with greater artistic pretensions. The latter continually confused the overall effect by adding their own individual flourishes. <laughs> the spectator's encounter with the panorama was not limited to mere perambulation of the interior of the cylinder at crown level. The panorama effect had to be experienced from high up. The central column of the building contained a hydraulic lift, London's first, a so-called ascending room, which viewers could be uh, by which viewers could be raised at what some found nausea-inducing speed to the three viewing platforms. Both the lift and the presence of multiple platforms undersco underscores the control of viewers' perceptions in what was so critical to the panorama effect, in particular the enclosed claustrophobic space of the lift and the uncommon disorientating sense of moving upwards created maximum effect for the moment, the weit hoch herrlich moment, um, uh, in, in when the lift doors opened and the seemingly limitless vistas of the vast cityscape appeared before the spectator. Further up the building, various other facilities were imagined. You can see them planned there. Um, until finally, at the top, the most intrepid visitors could exit the building onto the roof and in what one paper charmingly called, quote, a transition from the pictorial to the positive, see the real city laid out before them in uncanny repetition. Many, not least the promoters, pronounced the interior representation superior to <laughs> external reality. In particular, ironically, because the authentic Outdoor vista was now almost permanently shrouded in the smoke of domestic and industrial pollution. It's clear that the entire commercial enterprise was intended to be what we might call today a leisure centre or amusement complex, and that inevitably, given the sums of money invested, it needed to appeal over a relatively extended period to multiple echelons of the paying public, not just to the most elite. As an indication of that, it cost one shilling to get in, and if any of you know about the situation in the um, Great Exhibition, in 1851, the so-called shilling days were the days when a, a new uh, type of um, uh, uh, a new type of viewer could be introduced to the whole thing. So the building's attractions were and needed to be multiple. On the ground floor was space for various exhibitions, 
Walking through six conservatories that flanked the building, visitors could enter a tunnel that just transported them to a Swiss cottage, looking out through its windows onto sublime depictions of alpine views. Later, as James Davis discussed some years ago, one intrepid explorer, fresh from a, a, a trip to distant southern shores, con constructed an African glen, complete with tigers and other unlikely inhabitants to titillate further the London audience. A couple more pictures of the Colosseum. Okay. Um, so many intriguing questions emerge. In particular, why did the most grandiose manifestation of a panorama in London feature the very city in which it was located? <laughs> One obvious answer, much gestured towards at the time, and not unrelated to elite artists shunning of the city as an object of representation, has to do with anxieties in the face of ever-increasing urban complexity. As the 19th century city inexorably expanded, so the story goes, did it become ever more opaque, ever more unreadable in its sprawling totality. In, 19, in 1837, the Penny Magazine, a publication in part devoted to inspiring the working classes with a patriotic sense of their country's preeminence, described the effect of the city thus, again wavering significantly between modern science and timeless nature in its search for adequate metaphors. Here is description of London. Quote, the sense of self-importance among inhabitants is crushed and almost withered. The inhabitant knows nobody and nobody knows him. He is a mere atom among the thousands that flit around, a drop of rain that has fallen into the ocean. Unquote. A paragraph later, the writer emphasizes further by saying <coughs> that, quote, London becomes truly a living panorama. In this sense, panoramas based on cityscapes were, in modern co commentator Bernard Comon's words, a palliative. Here's what he said, quote, They gave individuals the happy feeling that the world was organized around and by them. Yet this was a world from which they were also separated and protected, for they were seeing it from a distance. A double dream came true, one of totality and of possession encyclopedism on the cheap, unquote. In this context, it's significant that after the dizziness and wonder of the first encounter, one regular pastime of viewers was to identify their own street and house, thus placing themselves securely uh, into the vast picture before them. However, I think there's a danger that one can overemphasize this aspect, what we might call the panorama as a kind of reverse panopticon, it seems clear from various reports that the feeling of being a mere atom did not entirely disappear and could in some cases even be exacerbated by prolonged experience to the panorama. Indeed, it was not unusual to describe the vista in drastic terms. The fact that there was no frame, no edge to the representation, frequently caused the first visitors to experience strange symptoms of nausea and dizziness, with, of course, the fair sex particularly vulnerable and constantly in need of solicitous manly protection. Mm -hmm. Hence also perhaps the need for more or less elaborate guides to the experience. At the Colosseum engravings of the panoramic, panoramic scene, conventional and thus comforting and reassuring representations of the view so grandly presented were placed at strategic intervals along with elaborate prose descriptions of what could be seen from various vantage points. These provided structure and anchoring, schooling viewers in a particular way of looking and thus rationalising the otherwise disturbingly limitless space of experience. Thus was the disquiet that arose with the experience contained. Now, one further trope of the Colosseum's early reception is, I suggested earlier, central for my purposes. Today, it concerns the panorama, the real one, as what we might call a sounding body. 
Immediately, though, the frequent remarks one finds in contemporary sources are rather about the absence of sound. This perceived gap in the realistic effect inspired a great range of reactions, some hallucinatory or perhaps aspirational, some carping and nev negative, some bizarrely taking the form of aesthetic theorization. In the first category, Richard Altick cites a Persian visitor who claimed to have heard, quote, a great noise of carriage, coach and horse. And several commentators mentioned distant bells. These seem to have been imaginings, perhaps encouraged by the realism of the visual display. It seems significant here that in the absence of any scripted sounds, sound effects or musical background, some spectators found a way to make their own imagined soundtracks, their own Schubertian underpinning. More often, journalistic visitors reacted to the optical realism of the display in a more empirical manner, simply noting that sounds demanded by the visual field were missing. As the Athenaeum put it, referring to the Campanile Towers of St. Paul's, the nearest objects on the panorama as they were part of the site of the original drawing, quote, on the canvas they are actually 40 feet high, and they are painted with a force and a truth and an attention to detail which render them perfectly deceptive. All that surprises us when looking at them is that so long, so long a time elapses without the sonorous striking of the great clock. Unquote. Another visitor who braved the very summit of the building and could thus gaze down on the real cityscape was unsettled there by the, quote, murmur of the busy millions below, finding it, quote, too contradictory to the room-like closeness and silence of the picture gallery we've just left. On the other hand, to those here well versed in 19th century art critical attitudes, it will come as no surprise that some early commentators, particularly if with neoclassical aesthetic viewpoints, heartily approved of the silence that enfolded those who gazed at these vast canvases, the absences within the representations as they thought proper being supplied by the imagination of the viewer. However, when it, become, it also becomes clear that as the panorama's invitation to participate in or perhaps be subjugated by the double dream took hold, increasing numbers of critics were struck by, even unnerved by, the melancholy silence in which such communal reverie seemed typically to take place. On the whole, the silence, in principle part of any recipe for the sublime, actually functioned to darken the experience of the panorama and to engineer a failure of suspended disbelief. One lengthy account of a Colosseum visit, complete with, quote, obligingly slight reminiscences of seasickness, quote, unquote, as the hydraulic lift made its ascent, reacted to the viewing room with the following outburst, quote, What preternatural darkness and portentous silence! The spectators look like dismal ghosts and point and whisper awfully around us, unquote. In 1849, the painter Charles Robert Leslie summed up this recurrent problem, which is very often mentioned in the papers. Here's what he said. I would ask whether others have not felt what has always occurred to me in looking at a panorama, that exactly in the degree in which the eye is deceived, the, the, in, in which the eye is deceived, the stillness of the figures and the silence of the place produces a strange and somewhat unpleasant effect, and the more so if the subject places us in the city. We want the hum of population, we want the din of carriages. Unquote. In this context, the seventh book of Wordsworth's great poem, The Prelude, written in 1805 to 6, has a notable passage on the panoramas. Small surprise that Wordsworth disapproved of such comparatively demotic attractions. Here's what he said, quote, I do not here allude to subtlest craft by means refined attaining purest ends, but imitations fondly made in plain, in, sorry, fondly made in plain confession of man's weakness and his loves, unquote. A little later, though, he also seems to refer to this problem 
of silence in the panoramas. It refers to them disparagingly as mute and still, as opposed to, quote, others of wider scope where living men, music and shifting pantomimic scenes together joined their multifarious aid to heighten the allurement, unquote. And music did indeed take a prominent place in several competing panoramas and, of course, in other non-elite entertainments. In less monumental venues, it was relatively easy to provide sound effects for scenes of natural splendour. Wind and thunder machines could be supplied on demand, and grand religious prospects had their own repertory. In 1835, a panoramic depiction of the interior of Florence's Santa Croce was accompanied by an organ, perhaps a mechanical one, playing a Haydn mass. What's more, static panoramas around which the spectators strolled increasingly gave way to shows that worked in the opposite way. The audience was fixed in one place and the canvas scrolled by them, a system that allowed for elaborately proto-cinematic sound effects, music very much included, that could be timed precisely to coincide with the details <coughs> then on display and presumably also to mask any noise generated by the mechanism in action. One of the earliest and most influential of these entertainments was Philippe Jacques de Lutherberg's Ida Fusicon, a representation of nature, a demonstration of complex depth and lighting effects within a small proscenium which took London by storm in the 1780s and which boasted a startling array of sound effects, including whistling wind, rushing water and thunderstorms judged more frightening than nature's own. Schooled as he was in theatrical practice, Lutherburg also employed prominent musicians to mark the interludes between his scenic marvels. But when it came to that ultimate self-representation, the largest London-based panorama of the city itself, no such sonic attainment, uh, entertainment was offered. The greatest city on earth, and probably the noisiest, remained stubbornly immersed in silence. But perhaps a static object, something that never moved, was bound to be so, or could be coupled to sound, noise or music, which are phenomena that move through time, only by a bold intervention of its sponsors that they could not at present imagine. Now I need to wind towards a conclusion. Unlike the Goethe poem in its Schubert setting, which had been lovingly preserved and which come down to us in bound volumes, critically edited texts, organized to be read and reread, their meanings to multiply through intercourse. Almost all of these fixed panoramas, as I said, indeed, and indeed the buildings that housed them, were summarily destroyed when no longer commercially viable. The Colosseum, as you see here at its, at its, uh, in its in its pomp, enjoyed some decades in the, in the sun. Indeed, it did, good, did a good trade in the Great Exhibition of 1851, which brought a flood of new consumers to the capital. But then it faltered. The very grandeur of its conception made it ill-equipped to adapt to new technologies. It staggered on into the 1860s. At one point, and with significance that I can't dwell on here, there was a proposal to convert it into another kind of temple, a Roman Catholic church. But that came to nothing. By 1875, the once mighty Colosseum had become a gloomy, ghostly wreck. And there it is. It was demolished to make way for Cambridge Gate, a row of terraced houses for the ever-expanding metropolitan populace. And if you fancy um, a penthouse apartment in Cambridge Gate, it will now cost you £25 million. Pounds. <laughs> I looked it up this morning. <laughs> Ironies of this downfall abound. One reason for the Colosseum's continually perilous financial state was clearly that its main attraction, the panorama, was unchanging and, after a while, itself liable to the depredations and pollution of the growing city. Even by the time it opened, Thomas Horner's original vista from St Paul's, drawn in the early 1820s, was out of date. The new post office depicted 
half completed by <coughs> 1929, was now long in use. London Bridge, on the other hand, had been replaced in 1825. One writer said the panorama's version offered, quote, quote, a ghost of the departed, unquote. Under certain circumstances, such fixity, the very phenomenon of unchanged stasis, might have seemed to an added attraction. But the panorama, like all such paintings in this new medium, struggled to create and maintain such pantheon-like stature. As mentioned some time ago, the social breadth of the audience it needed to ensure survival was a continual and eventually insuperable obstacle. In later decades, as the Colosseum made increasingly desperate efforts to sustain itself, there were, to be sure, musical sounds aplenty, but they did not save it for long. As early as 1838, then under the ownership of the celebrated tenor John Braham, it briefly became the home of London's first promenade concerts. Still later, an adjoining building called the Cyclorama staged a depiction of the Lisbon earthquake, accompanied by a frenzied collection of booming thunderbolts. Similar appropriate music emanated from a monster organ called the Apollonicon, which had 2,407 pipes and could imitate, and thus it was claimed, supersede all orchestral instruments and added to the general din by blaring forth excerpts from Don Giovanni, Albert's, Albert's Mazzaniello and Rossini's Mosè in Egitto. But for the earliest days of the Colosseum, we have no more than vague traces of its sounding practices, of the sounding practices the building and its giant painting elicited. There is nothing more than hallucinated bells or portentous silence or awful whispers. Returning to that earlier slide of the Colosseum still under construction, we can find near the top of the building a section marked L that is glossed underneath as rooms for music and balls. Financial Finances being what they were, it's very unlikely that those rooms for music were ever used and they would anyway seem to be impossibly small. No strain of quadrilles or waltzes, that is, drifted down to the ghostly figures perambulating and dreaming beneath. There were no reminders of social life down there, still left of the ever-burgeoning street music that was becoming such a domestic nuisance to bourgeois Londoners. Such lacunae underline the fact that one of musicology's greatest legacies the close reading I applied to Schubert's imagined panorama is not available here. Quite simply, there is no music to read. But the topic of panorama nevertheless, nevertheless seems to me of musicological interest and might even embed within it some issues about the rise of 19th century music that, still too, that are still too often sidelined. Of course, we could at this point merely relax into technological determinism the Colosseum in Regent's Park offered a massive, fixed viewing object, relatively unchanging, around which spectators wandered at their will. But there was, as I said, a rival technology that took the opposite tack, fixing the spectators in one place and scrolling the panoramic viewing object past them, the object thus able to be changed, frequently commodified, if you will. Well, we all know how that particular rivalry turned out in the 20th century, and there were many reasons, some adumbrated here, to explain the eventual triumph of the second technology, that which became the cinematic. But amid all these reasons, perhaps the affordances of sound, the way in which the scrolling object from the very start enabled a sounding accompaniment, while the fixed object struggled to do so, perhaps these are less often than they might be stressed in the histories of such technologies. On a related technological approach, we might hazard that those in charge of the Regent's Park Colosseum, that sorry, uh, those in charge of the re, in, of the of the Regent's Park Colosseum, in effect, in effect, lacked a concept of, or indeed any instances of what we might now call affectless music, music that is there for no other reason than to brush away the uncanny, to erase the sound of silence. And of course, we all know 
where that kind of music ended up in our own century and the one before, heard in restaurants while on call holding or in elevators at a site near you. It was another 20th century invention, first piped into people's homes, but then with the advent of radio <coughs> transfor transforming to the transferring to the commercial market. It's a constant, often lamented feature of our musical lives today, one whose prehistory is again not much studied, perhaps because of its lowly cultural status and ubiquity. Recall then that the Colosseum at Regent's Park, while it didn't of course invent the elevator, there were examples of a kind even in the ancient Roman Colosseum, had as one of, the, as one of its attractions that novel ascending room to take com uh, customers to the viewing platforms. What its creators didn't, what they couldn't conceive of to fill the sonorous environment of those platforms, was one of the 20th century's least glorious inventions, the one we call elevator music. But both of these technological conclusions seem to me rather thin, missing as they do the complex specificity of the Colosseum's cultural ambience and the aspirations of its creators and consumers. Have we have seen the panorama craze in 19th century London sparked frequent debates about representation, about illusion versus reality, and some said the need to maintain a strict division between the two. On one level, metropolitan panoramic displays offered a space in which the gazing public could dream an urban dream, one in which the city was controllable, <coughs> its, limits, uh, its limits and boundaries visible, its place in time and space an object of edification and pride. But while one sense, the visual, might be transported into this alternative space, the city laid out, ordered, another sense, the oral, remained firmly grounded in the present, peopled by strangers whose whispered conversations became in the context strange and otherworldly, bodying forth a mournful gloom, brooding motionless, over the biggest and greatest town on earth. There seems little doubt that ambient sound in general could have aided the needs of the imagination. And surely elite music in particular, which was at precisely that time becoming increasingly unmoored from semantic specificities, might have assisted the dreamers. But was such music thought apposite music to accompany the cityscape? It was not to be. The rise of music had not penetrated that far. Musical panoramas remained the province of the elite among craggy rocks and sublime vistas. The medium could not yet assist in the double dream of the legible city. Thank you. Questions. But maybe I could ask the first question. You must. <laughs> and I was thinking about the silence actually, whether you yeah. could say more, because at the end you actually were saying that it wasn't exactly silence and that there were whispered conversations. But I was thinking also the elevator must have made an awful lot of noise as well that was yeah. going up. So there would have been ambient ambient sounds, there would have been noise in the I just wanted to know going up, yeah. Yeah, whether whether there's whether you could say more about the, the kind of the distinctions between, I mean, the, the, the silence wouldn't exactly have been silence. But it's it, embarrassed, it's, it's restaurant, whispery restaurant sound. Do, we, do you know that? Do they write about that? That's well? what they say, they yeah. can hear whispers. I think people are not used at that time to having, having large spaces where numbers of people are with silence. I mean, the, the, the elephant in the room, actually, in, in talking about this, and I don't know enough about it, and some people here may know, is another kind of developing technology, which is that of the art exhibition, you know, where you're wandering in some kind of silence there. But I think it's different in that the, perspect, the perspectival uh, aspect, you're more, um, you, you have more freedom in that sense because of that reason. There's a couple back there, yeah. Yeah. I'll just uh, ask this one. Thank you, Rob. Uh, just marvelous talk here. 
One thing that struck me, and I think you touched on, but um, the sort of absence of sound and some of what music is hoped as giving us um, makes me wonder about uh, the effectual response of the people to these things. You mentioned a lot of kind of physiological things, the, the nausea, the disorientation, um, but was there any discussion of uh, sort of more emotionally based responses to, the, uh, to this, especially in the absence of uh, yeah. structured sound? It's the, the adjectives they use are sometimes disconcerting, sometimes even more that there's horror, you know, is mentioned. It's this sense of enormous disquiet. Um, and um, the uncanny, the, um, the supernatural often comes out because it's a ghost-like silence. That's the problem. What do, what do crowds of people who are making no more, no, what can they be? They must be ghosts. They departed. And I, I didn't go into this, but I think one of the other things that <clears throat> is happening increasingly is this, this panorama is, of London is fixed in time. And years later, you're looking on your own house, perhaps, but you might also be looking at the house of your dead mother or, you know, those things. So it's looking down on a, on a, a, on a cityscape, which is, from a personal point of view, increasingly inhabited by dead people that you used to know. Yeah, there's one at the back there. Uh, two things. Um, were churches ever quiet? And yeah. are there anecdotal reports of spectators in postcards, in diaries? Has anyone ever tried to sort of assemble sort of the with the, in, in terms of the church, you mean? No, no, in, in, in terms of the panorama. Yeah, in terms of the panorama, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a huge volume of literature about it. And, you know, I was just cherry picking there. There's, yeah. there's plenty more where that came from. I think the church is an interesting one, actually, and it's one I gave some thought to, where, where are large numbers of people gathered and silent? Um, some people know more than me. Um, about this. I'm not sure they were as silent as they are these days very often. Um, but they might have been silent in prayer, um, but then they're doing something. Yeah, They've got a purpose in there. And I don't think looking at a panorama was, was sufficient. So yeah, I think the church is an interesting test case. And I don't know whether anyone has done any work about noise, about sound in churches. And it would be extremely interesting to know about it. Did anyone at the time try to collate or anthologize, assemble popular, popular experience you know, in, in the vernacular? Not that I know of. Not that I know of. They're just individual reports. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking of two things. One is Mrs. Todger's boarding house, the great panorama in. Martin Chuzzlewit, and you're making me understand something about that that I hadn't understood before, which is that it's all about everything being stymied, you know, that the oranges are rotting because the traffic isn't moving. Yeah. And it's almost like there's an inside joke there about the stasis of the panorama that I hadn't thought about before. Right? It, it, yeah, it could be, because that, what's that, is that 45 or something? Uh, 44, I think, 30, Yeah, 30, so, so that figures. It's, it's beginning to get into decline. At that point, and it's also yeah, it's 15 years old by that stage. So another um, yeah, an interesting uh, an interesting fact which I, I didn't mention here. One of the ironies of it, I, I said that you couldn't uh, when you got up to the top and looked at the real city, you couldn't see it because there was so much uh, pollution going on. But interestingly, that gradually that pollution obviously came into the building itself and began to affect the walls of the panorama so it got it got sort of um, uh, um, second stage pollution by uh, by the time it became virtually um, a very much more much more difficult to, to see as time went on can I try more of a real question now yeah is it has it got the mr. W uh, no. Oh, right. no. Um, it's about uh, it's about your sh the great thing you did with Schubert there in the beginning and the Goethe's panor panorama. Yeah. And, I, and I was just I was gonna make trouble for you 
um, and say that it isn't in the 1770s. It wouldn't be a panorama; it would be a prospect, right? Yeah, because the, yeah. the technology that emerges exist, yeah. in, the, in the 1790s, <coughs> and the prospects go way back. Uh, maybe Milton's got prospects yeah. of paradise lost, um, uh, and and they don't. The prospects don't involve technology in the same way that the panorama does. The question I'm sort of groping for is about w what you're after with the Schubert there, because I thought that was really interesting, but I'm not sure I quite got it about technology. The yeah. Um, yeah. Are, are are you saying that Schubert, in in going back to that thing which is which was in the 1770s, not a panorama but a prospect, kind of infused it with the sort of technology that the panorama would bring to these big overviews in the 1790s? Is, is that, is that no. what you're doing? You're not, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I, wish, I wish I was clever enough to have done that. But, um, yeah, the prospect, um, the, it's interesting, a lot of, there's been a lot of recent writing about Caspar David Friedrich and, uh, you know, The Wanderer in the Mist, the famous poem, uh, sorry, picture we all know. And uh, treating that as a panorama, um, almost before the fact. So that there's a kind of continuity going on between between those things. I think, um, I have to say, um, I've been wrestling with, with this paper for a long time, and uh, it could be that the whole opening six pages about Schubert belongs somewhere else. Um, it would certainly make more sense um, in some ways not to do it, but increasingly... I just thought it it makes a disciplinary point about how much easier it is to talk about music when it's got a score. Yeah. <laughs> um, and once you start, once you get into the world of sound studies, yeah. um, all the professional kind of expertise that one spends one's life gaining uh, almost disappear. But there's still a reason for musicologists to think about sound in that way because I think they often think about sound in different ways from other people. So I wanted to keep those two things in, one of which is so easy to do. It might seem complex to some of you who are musicologists, but seekers will always be finders when you've got a score in front of you and because that's what we're taught to do. You were kind of looking for a score for the car horns on Grand Avenue. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You wanted to know if those manufacturers yeah. had gotten together and made a score. Exactly. Um, so um, whether that disciplinary point is actually part of my larger project, um, I'm still not sure. Yes. So I just wanted to say about uh, churches that, of course, the churches had one distinct advantage, and that is that they all contained organs, yeah. and organists were trained to improvise on these, you know, very short, ephemeral kinds of uh, music that yeah. in many cases don't uh, survive. I mean, you know, even going way back to Fresco Baldi. And, and yeah, and I think, I mean, the the other thing about the church, I should have said this earlier, the, 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 the difference with the panorama um, in the church, um, you have something scrolling in front of you, all of you at the same time. It's called the service, you know, whatever's going on. There's one show in town, yeah. The issue with the panorama was that people were all over it. It's 360 degrees are moving around it, so there can be no one story. So the church is more like the cinema, the, cinema, the proto-cinematic panorama if you want, scrolling before you. And that's actually what classical, that's what music is. It scrolls before you. I mentioned that at one point, that um, it's very difficult. How do you, once you liberate the audience, then, then what kind of music do you need? Yeah. Yeah, David. Um, so I was wondering, extremely interesting, I was wondering whether one might think of it in the other direction, that is that um, what is being trained here is a mode of apprehension. That in By, music, the, by the panorama. By the mean, panorama. Yeah. Yeah. That, that in music, in a sense, that the viewer or auditor is silenced in order to apprehend the music, 
But is it not the case that in some sense you have to train an audience to apprehend both the cityscape, but also the difference between the apprehension of the city in the city and the city in the panorama? And that that might in some sense require a difference in behavior. Sort of like when you go into church, you know, be quiet. Yeah. But is there a way in which it, in some sense, the technology would require a difference of disposition? That, well, that was obviously the intention. That was clearly the intention, if it had been thought through in those terms. But the, the idea, I think, I, I, don't, I don't think it, I think quite obviously um, this was constructed to be a visual marvel. And the creators of it had not thought about what the sound, what the sound would be around it. But yeah, they were definitely that business of, and it's very often mentioned in early panoramas that what you're doing is training the viewers. And very often, the, part of that is also these, these sort of plans that are laid out around it, showing you how to look, where to look, which still exist, don't they, on in, in uh, often on on high buildings and so on. But um, yeah, the other thing I didn't mention, you know, there's I, I didn't I wanted to avoid high theory as much as possible, so I didn't go into Soto and you know the um, that that kind of jive because I had enough of it. Yes. Um, are, is there um, any mention about it being soundproof, like any sounds from outside? Does yeah, come in? I don't. No one mentions any sound from outside, and. Uh, I think it was so large and so, um, well, we got it here. It's built, you know, <laughs> pretty serious stuff there. Um, I don't think there was any sound, sound penetration. You see the carriages go by, and carriages certainly made as much noise as motor cars do today, although one hopes they didn't have the horns of the same. Um, <laughs> But um, no one mentions sounds from outside. They wish for sounds from outside, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid my, my question doesn't have, have to do with sound, but I'm just thinking about the meaning of, um, of visiting this in light of the fact that, so that they're looking at a view of what it looks like from the dome of St. Paul. And I just wondered who could, who could ascend St. Paul's to see that view at this t time? I mean, is the, is the idea that like you don't have to climb the stairs or that no one was allowed to climb the stairs and have a look as you're, as you're allowed to do now. Yeah, they, uh, I, Thomas Horner got special permission to go up there okay. and it put a um, scaffolding up because he obviously needed to see all the way around. It was possible to go up there, I think, uh, if you knew the right vicar you know, <laughs> um, at that time. But I do, I mean, I, I think the the idea which was seemed on the surface to be a very strange one, actually, that uh, you would create this panorama of London and say, oh, by the way, if you want to go up to the top, you can see the real panorama of London. It was an extraordinarily sort of bold thing to do. Um, and um, I've had to have got my head round why that was the case. It's an interesting irony. You're about to answer the question. No, I wasn't. I was just going to comment that um, climbing St. Paul's was partly about the acoustic effect as well. Wasn't yeah, it? yeah. The With the dome. Down. Once you got into the dome. Yeah. 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 I mean, this, uh, the, yeah, the, the, um, architectural historians could talk a long time about this, this sort of monumental, you know, with the columns and those uh, on the outside, which are purely, you know, that's purely ornamental, just to bring in the, the punters. Yes. Uh, would visitors to the, the panorama have uh, been comparing the experience to the experiences they had in the theater and to the stage machinery of the theater? Um, yeah. I would think there'd be a resemblance there to the, the moving panorama. And I wonder, too, mm. whether the, the popularity of the panoramas had any kind of influence on how the theater evolved. Yeah, the... Um, yeah, certainly, and uh, my my friend here has written something about that. I mean, there is a there is a continuity, an absolute continuity th between theatrical practice and these scrolling panoramas, as you would expect. Um, in fact, the same kinds of theatre designers often 
design those those ones. It's just with a bit more, you know, emphasis on on the visual. So there's a, there's an absolute continuity there. Um, the continuity I think with these um, with these static panoramas is more. Um, uh, there's there's quite a lot of um, promenade music. I mean, the nearest to this, I think, in the 19th century, are quite a lot of concerts were organised where the music would be in one place in the centre on a bandstand or something like that, and people would be wandering around it freely. But then, of course, the the the, the object of attention is not visual primarily; it's sonorous, and that 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 kind of uh, yeah promenade. Uh, um, is is fits in with this a little better, but the, yeah, with the <coughs> with the scrolling, the proto cinematic ones, there's an absolute um, continuity with theatre. Yeah, I, I think that's probably a good moment for us to let you go, Roger. Okay. So thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>